the God that we love tells Israel to go and annihilate basically genocide. It's difficult, it's confusing. But they're, they're, they're using some kind of historical event to tell a moral story. These, these kind of texts would include you know, God uh, killing the earth in the flood, uh, commanding Abraham to offer uh, or sacrifice his son Isaac, you know, the status of women, the practice of slavery. How do we make sense of God um, asking his people to do these things? Welcome to Friends Online. Today, we're gonna to do things differently, because we gotta talk. So Russia's at war with Ukraine. Russia has invaded Ukraine. And I was studying for this message for Friends Online, and I was studying out of Joshua chapter six. And if you've read that book of the Bible, when you get to chapter six, you'll see that God commands his people to invade another people group. So you can imagine how uncomfortable I became. And to be honest, I didn't quite know how to answer it. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna peek in on a conversation that discusses this very question. So Aaron Opog has a podcast called The Resilient Christian. And what they do is they have really authentic conversation around tough issues like this. Because he's, he's seen people that have just recently come to faith fall away from their faith because of things like this, because of difficulties in the Bible like this. And we've also seen a lot of people that have been Christians for a long time start to deconstruct their faith because of tough issues like this. So Aaron reached out to a uh, Old Testament professor of biblical studies who his area of study is on violence in the Old Testament. And they bring up this very subject. And so what we're gonna do for this episode of Friends Online is we're gonna peek into their conversation. And we're gonna watch about 25 minutes of a 40 minute conversation. And uh, if, you, if you stick with me to the end, uh, I'm gonna pop back in and give you a couple more resources if you wanna continue diving into this question. So let's listen in. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Resilient Christian Podcast. I'm Aaron, your host, and thank you again for listening and watching and being part of our discussion. Today we get to jump into a topic that is really difficult but really important. In the Old Testament, in Joshua chapter six, God tells Israel, commands Joshua to go into the land, uh, the promised land, and to really annihilate and take out all of the other nations. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 21, it's a summary of uh, this moment. It says this, They devoted uh, the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. This is a very difficult passage because in it, uh, the God that we love tells Israel to go and annihilate, basically genocide, all of these people um, in this area, in this region. And as we look at the Bible, sometimes we're uncomfortable. We don't know how to make sense of it. And so today we've invited Dr. Blair Wilgus, professor of biblical studies at Hope International, to join us on the show to help us give us a broad sense of how to make a, a good interpretation of these passages. And so Blair, thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to be with us on our show. Thanks, Aaron, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so we look at this passage and there's this word called harem. And uh, my Hebrew's not that great, uh, this is your field. Uh, but this word harem is this kind of description of annihilation of the Canaanites and the other people that Joshua had to go conquer. Um, for many Christians and non-Christians, when they read this passage, it's difficult, it's confusing, especially with who we know God to be in his character. Can you give us kind of the broad um, strokes of how to interpret and make sense of these passages of war in the Old Testament? Uh, sure. Um, let me, uh, maybe let me step back a little bit and just talk about how, um, because this is a big discussion, uh, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, real difficult to, to, to wrestle with, and there's a lot of different approaches. It's not a, here's the answer. I wish I could say, here's the answer, but let me tell you a little bit about how some people approach it, and then we can kind of focus in on those harem passages. Um, if I uh, make a, maybe a key distinction, uh, when we're talking about God and, and war, the conquest uh, with Joshua, uh, that's a, kind of a sub-discussion of a broader topic of the violence of God. Uh, so, uh, you know, God commands war uh, in the Old Testament, but these, these kind of texts would include, you know, God uh, killing the earth in the flood, uh, commanding Abraham to offer uh, or sacrifice his son Isaac, uh, 
death of the firstborn in Egypt, you know, the status of women, the practice of slavery, all of these issues of violence uh, in the Bible uh, is kind of the big broader discussion of which the conquest is part. Uh, and so if, uh, these discussions, if I can oversimplify them into two different approaches, um, the, uh, a lot of people, or maybe maybe half, half the discussion is about trying to defend God, and they uh, tried to explain how this violence was necessary uh, or that it arose out of God's holiness. Uh, they try and draw attention to uh, human sinfulness, the, de the depravity of the people that God is killing, uh, or the benefits that come as a result of God's violence. So that's kind of one side of the discussion. And then the other side of the discussion are uh, those that question or critique uh, divine violence. Try, uh, and this, this approach tries to recognize uh, the, the human component of Scripture, uh, recognize that the Bible does not always accurately depict God. Uh, they use kind of this nonviolent Jesus as a ruler by which they measure or evaluate uh, other pictures of God. So we've got these two, the, the attempt to, de to defend or, or, or uh, agree with the violence that we see in the Bible and the attempt to uh, critique uh, or question it. And so those, that, that same kind of spectrum uh, then applies just to this issue of Joshua and the, uh, the conquest. Um, it's probably worth pointing out, anyone that talks about this, everyone, at least to my knowledge, that talks about this will, will, will state right up front, God's practice, God's command in the Old Testament is not warrant for believers to do so today. And uh, Christians are not to use military force to convert others to the gospel. So just get that right out of the way. We're still left with a God in, uh, especially the Old Testament, but in places in the New uh, that uses violence. Um, and how do, we, how do we wrestle with this? And so uh, if I can give kind of two, again, contrasting pictures, uh, Tremper Longman uh, who was formerly from Westmont in uh, Santa Barbara, he says there's spiritual continuity between the Testaments. So in the Old Testament, it is God that fights. Uh, God fights Israel's enemies. God at times fights Israel itself. Uh, uh, there's the belief that God will fight, uh, will come back and fight when the need arises again. But God did literally engage in Israel's military conflicts. Uh, and then in the New Testament, this is, uh, there's some continuity there, uh, but it's, it's a, a slight discontinuity as well. In the New Testament, Jesus fights spiritual powers and authorities, and Jesus will come back to fight in the final battle. So there's continuity in this image of God as warrior, but discontinuity in how that warfare takes place. Then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, C.S. Cowles talks about a radical discontinuity. Um, he, uh, he says that the Old Testament is Christian scripture, uh, but it's not by itself a Christian message. So he almost decanonizes the Old Testament. Um, he, he contrasts this idea of God as a warrior in the Old Testament with the idea of uh, a loving God that we see in the New Testament uh, and says that the New Testament is radically opposed to that image of God. Um, he uses this Christological hermeneutic Jesus uh, God is interpreted by Jesus, and the New Testament picture of Jesus shows us that Israel misunderstood or misinterpreted God. And so we should base our image based on that peaceful, loving example of, uh, of Christ. It's a big spectrum. There's lots of places uh, in between uh, nuances, uh, numerous different uh, types, uh, uh, points of uh, conversation, but that kind of gives us a range of the uh, options that are out there. Let's get into the Joshua passage and... and uh, can you walk us through some of the key elements and issues in interpreting God's command to Israel to conquer the Canaanites? How do we make sense of, of those specific passages? Sure. <clears throat> well, you, uh, you already mentioned uh, harem, that's the Hebrew word, uh, and you uh, offered uh, two translations for it. You used the word annihilate, uh, and uh, as you read the passage, um, it said dedicated or devoted to the Lord. Um, there's a number of different translations, but uh, when, when you read in these battles in the Old Testament uh, stories where Israel completely destroys or devotes to God, uh, those are different translations of harem. Uh, and that's a very difficult uh, word to translate, uh, and it's a, a very big concept to describe. Uh, so let me uh, try and kind of summarize that. There's, this harem is the consecration of something or some, uh, someone uh, as an offering uh, uh, to God. 
So in war, um, well, if we divide uh, the spoils of war into three categories, uh, so the the riches, if they you know if they conquer and, and take over a, a, a temple or a palace, you know there's gold, silver, bronze. Those those things are devoted to God by being picked up and placed in Israel's uh, tabernacle or temple. Um, if they encounter people, they are completely killed. They're they're uh, killed, burnt. City uh, uh, non non living objects, buildings are destroyed. Uh, these things are not for human use. So uh, treasures are are for God's use. Uh, humans can't take uh, Israel can't take the humans as slaves or as wives, and the buildings aren't to be lived in. Everything is completely devoted, destroyed, given up to God. Um, this. This idea, uh, the the connection between the spoils of war and devotion to God, uh, had initially uh, prompted some people to talk about holy war. Israel is engaging in holy war, and a number of scholars I think have helpfully dis, uh, distinguished uh, the, our kind of uh, concept of holy war with what Israel did. Um, Israel's war uh, is not in itself holy. Israel, as a people, had to consecrate themselves in order to go into war. But the nature of Israel's battle was, I think, better called Yahweh war because in these battles, Yahweh was the one that fought. So these were uh, this was his bat. This was Yahweh's battle, uh, and uh, these were Yahweh's possessions. Yeah. If you, will. As I think about Exodus fifteen three, I think it says, "I'm the Lord your God, the God who fights for you." And that sounds like that. That this is this is God's kind of battle. That's a really good summary. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Now, interestingly, um, there are different texts give different reasons for the Haram. So Deuteronomy 20 is kind of Israel's uh, manual of battle. What, what does a battle look like? How do you, how do you go about it? Uh, and the reason given in Deuteronomy 20 for the Haram is that if Israel doesn't kill everyone that lives in the land, then those people will teach Israel to worship other gods. Joshua 6 uh, when they're right, when they're about to go in, uh, the uh, the reason given there is that these objects are consecrated to Yahweh for Yahweh's possession and use. These are a gift. Uh, in Genesis 15, this is in the first uh, co uh, uh, covenant uh, with Abram. Um, uh, God says, "In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back, uh, uh, because the people of the land, their sin of the people of the land, is not great enough." So there's the idea that Israel is acting as God's uh, punishment. Um, let's see. Mm. Yeah, I think that that, that kind of covers it. There's the, uh, the preventing Israel from being tempted, the need yeah. to uh, carry out uh, punishment, the devotion to God. Um, but I think it's also, uh, it's also important to, keep, uh, to point out that uh, Harem was not unique to Israel. Yeah. Uh, so the the Moabite uh, Meshesteli, which is um, uh, uh, from it was it was discovered in uh, oh, man now my my memory's fading. It's yeah. from the ninth century, so it's about four hundred years after uh, the the conquest. Uh, but we have uh, the same term, the same kind of uh, language used, where the god of Moab, Chemosh, spoke to the king. Go take Nebo from Israel. I went, mm. fought against it, and I took it, and I totally destroyed it. That harem there. So this concept of harem is not unique to Israel, and it yeah. seems like we can talk about this as their cultural way of talking about war. I think that huh. that's a that's an appropriate uh, understanding yeah. uh, that this is the way uh, war was talked about in the ancient Near East. So the way that they made sense of doing war was through this, this filter of harem and other cultures would um, seek to do harem on other cultures as well when they, when they would take over other land. And this is, this is common, this was a normal thing, you think? Well, <clears throat> there's only one, the, 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 the Mesha uh, uh, stone is the, or the Moabite stone is the only uh, instance that we have found so far of this. Gotcha. So I don't know that okay. I would say it's common, but we have at least one instance, which I think uh, would testify to the fact that it was not unique. I think that's yeah. a fair appraisal. How, as Christians um, who are listening, how do we make sense of God um, asking 
his people to do these things. It makes sense that he's fighting that battle and that's his. I think the tension that we are all feeling is, especially in light of the current conflict and war in Europe. I, okay, so um, how do we kind of meld these two together between what we see, you know, in the New Testament, and the Old Testament, you know, kind of what the, the continuity perspective Sure. Do we, are we, are we to kind of just lean in that direction or, or do we find middle ground? How do we, how do we make sense of this God who does that? Sure. Well, let me, uh, uh, you know, if I'm laying my t- cards on the table, I would fall more into Cal's category of a, a discontinuity. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's a little bit more complex than that. So, um, if we're talking about the conquest, uh, there's actually two versions of the conquest in Joshua. Yeah. In chapters 1 through 12, Joshua and Israel took the entire land. They took everything. Chapter 11 is very clear. This happened in Joshua's life. God gave them everything. They didn't make peace with anyone. They owned the land. Yeah. And then in the second half of the book, chapter 13 to 24, there's a different version of the conquest. It took a long time. It's not finished at the end of Joshua's life. His final yeah. speech recognizes that not everyone was driven out. The entire book of Judges is predicated on the fact that Israel hadn't conquered the land. So we've got half of the book that said they had, half the book that says they haven't. Uh, and Judges is the kind of the, the follow-up to this long conquest. Yeah. And I think that the archaeological record kind of fits with that second version of Joshua. There's very little widespread destruction. Yep. Uh, and this indicates that Israel dispossessed. They pushed out uh, the indigenous people rather than completely destroying yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, so they took over the promised land. But there's a difference between what we think of as a historical account and what Israel talks about in what we call their historical books, which are probably more accurately described as using historical events for a moral purpose. Mm, mm. So if we draw this together, you know, talking about the harem and what we can see uh, in the the actual text of uh, Joshua and Judges uh, in the archaeological uh, record, um, I think we could say that in addition, Israel never carried out the harem. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Harem the, was never com- done. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, now they talked as if it was in yeah. certain texts, but but the reality is they never actually did it. Uh, and this was a cultural term. So I think we can say, in addition to them never actually doing it, I think the story that God told them to do it was more a cultural artifact than an account that, uh, that it actually happened. So mm. essentially, I would say that God didn't tell them to kill all the Canaanites. This is mm. the way that they talked about going to war we go to the war and every uh, you know we have christians on both sides of the uh, uh both sides of the arm on uh, different different armies they're both praying to god everyone in the ancient near east talked to their god believe their god was fighting for them and this idea of harem was a cultural artifact uh, i think that we can say god didn't kill them that's that was a cultural way of talking about going to war um and they didn't do it uh, mm-hmm. as well but the very important thing is not to say God didn't say it, Israel didn't do it, this text is useless. What we're doing with a cultural memory, what Israel does with this as a a cultural memory is they're using some kind of historical event. So everyone would say, I think, that something happened. There was an exodus, there was some kind of a conquest, but they're they're, they're using some kind of historical event to tell a moral story. And Mm. those lessons that that Israel's telling are what's important. So rather than focus on God as a warrior, historical story about killing the Canaanites. What we need to do is look at what those texts are actually about. Mm. Mm. And so then we start looking at, okay, this idea of fulfillment of promise. Uh, Joshua's 24 chapters, uh, the first 11 are about the battle, but really there's there's only three battle accounts uh, that are described. Most of them are just summarized very briefly. The, the detail in the book of Joshua is about what tribe gets to live in what land. It's the most important part of the book, or the most boring part of the book. Here's the cities that you get. Here's the cities that you get. Why is that important? Because God promised land and delivered. God is uh, faithful to promises. That makes sense. Okay, that's good. That's really helpful. I think it's always really good for us as Christians to wrestle with the mysteries of the scripture, you know, and... Uh, we as a church uh, and as a you know, podcast believe in the inspiration of the scriptures and we want to wrestle with these texts well and figure out how do we make sense of them all. Um, sure. Looking more into the New Testament now, uh, we are told in the Bible, I believe it's in, in Romans, to um, not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. Uh, what does the Bible say about overcoming evil practically practically? 
even in light of some of these texts in the Old Testament? Sure. Um, <clears throat> when I begin my class, uh, I teach a class on uh, violence in the Old Testament. Uh, mm -hmm. I start out by saying this semester we're going to spend a lot of time looking closely at a few texts that are very negative. There's much more uh, to the Old Testament than these violent texts. And, yeah. <laughs> and as you know, we've already pointed out that the New yeah. Testament uh, predominantly looks a lot different. So if we focus too much on a certain issue or these kind of negative texts, that's all we see. Uh, and that can be kind of overwhelming uh, and put a negative taste in our mouth about the Bible. But there's much more to it uh, than that. Yeah. Um, I'm an Old Testament professor, so I was thinking about this uh, through uh, the portion of the Bible that I tend to read. Um, how do, um, I think Genesis 12, God's promise to uh, Abram, the, that first blessing, um, I will bless you and through you uh, all nations on earth will be blessed. Uh, this, this blessing, this choice of Abram uh, and Abraham and his family is for the purpose of blessing everyone. Mm. John Golden Gay says that this shows that God is primarily about blessing not primarily about violence and cursing. I think that's a really helpful distinction. Yeah. The, the beginning of the nation of Israel, this family that turned into nation, uh, is where God begins, and this is for the purpose of blessing. Mm. Uh, there are a number of anti-war uh, and, and, and texts that condemn uh, war in the mm. Old Testament. Um, Isaiah 30, 31, salvation is in peace and rest. Uh, Israel is to trust in God, not in the horses. War is not an ideal or a goal. Uh, it is certainly more uh, a part of life in the ancient Near East than it is for us today. Um, but uh, even then they knew uh, that they wanted something else. A number of prophecies uh, uh, often, in uh, prophecies that look to a time past judgment. So prophets often, uh, almost always spoke a word of judgment, uh, but uh, oftentimes after, uh, they would talk about a time after judgment. And that time after judgment was almost always anti-war and pro-peace. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Isaiah 9, uh, that's mm -hmm. the, uh, the Emmanuel prophecy. Uh, it's the destruction of symbols and tools of war. Uh, the final title for that figure is Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah 11, the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> this uh, figure is going to destroy injustice with words rather mm -hmm. than with weapons. The infant's going to play with the cobra. Uh, Micah 5, the ruler's going to come to shepherd and be peace. Uh, so I think that uh, when Israel thought about uh, the uh, their the ideal world, it was a world of peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think that that's really helpful because we can look at the Old Testament and think, okay, this is a lot of violent judgment, uh, but the reality was they pictured and longed for peace. And that's that'll uh, preach. In fact, I, I preached a little bit on Shalom this past weekend at our church, and just that one of the major themes of the Bible could be summarized as shalom, as, as God wanting to bring peace between us and God, us and each other, and us and within ourselves. Sure. And I think what you're describing is, is that idea of shalom, and God really longs for, for peace that's not about violence or war. Um, that is such a beautiful picture of the heart of God you know, in all sure. of this. La last question, and then uh, we'll let you go. I know you're a busy man. Um, if someone asked you, why would a good God command his people to invade and destroy another nation? And you only had two minutes, like you're in an elevator with somebody who's a skeptic to all of this and they find out you're an Old Testament professor. What do you say in like those two minutes? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I think that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, inspiration of scripture is important, but it, uh, inspiration, uh, the authority of scripture involves understanding uh, how to read and, uh, and to correctly understand it. So at first glance, it might appear that God commands Israel to invade and destroy. Uh, not all biblical texts describe Israel's origins this way. Archaeology and a deeper reading of the Bible give us a different picture altogether. So texts in Deuteronomy and Joshua do describe this, but different texts in Joshua and Judges offer that contrasting picture. Uh, if we pay attention to you know, issues of genre, compositional history, cultural components, uh, the ideology of biblical authors. Uh, this shows us that these texts were written generations after uh, the events that they narrate. Uh, they were written using uh, forms of military speech that were common at that time. Uh, and they were, uh, they were used for purposes other than a strict recounting of history. If we, if we approach them expecting history, we're imposing our desire on it rather than looking for what it's trying to do. If we look at what this what this text is, what these texts are trying to do, uh, their cultural memory. They're used by the authors of scriptures to teach and highlight important truths such as obedience, the danger of apostasy, 
Israel's need for religious purity, Yahweh's promise to give them the land. This is what Israel's doing with those texts, and that's what we should pay attention to. So when we read these texts, look at how Israel used them, seek to translate that into our own setting. So we might reflect on faithful worship practices uh, and attitudes, the perpetual uh, importance even today of obedience uh, and the, uh, the, the never-ending faithfulness of God. But I would certainly say that we should reject the idea that God commanded the wholesale slaughter of entire peoples. Uh, that should not be the reality for uh, that would inf uh, that's not a reality that should inform our actions or our theology. That's good. Blair, thank you so much for your time. I know you're uh, busy teaching, and uh, this has been so helpful for us to make sense of these passages. Thank you for spending years studying these things. And um, remind us of the book again that you read on a, a war. You threw it out there. You said it's really good reading. Remind us of that so I can put it in the show notes for people. Sure. Uh, Eric Seibert's a great uh, author on this. He's got three books on it. His book, Disturbing Divine Behavior, is kind of an overview. Yeah. Uh, he talks about a couple different uh, theories uh, as well as proposes how to read the text. Uh, and then uh, one of his uh, more recent books, uh, Disarming the Church, is about how to live peacefully. So how do you live with, how do we, how do we act uh, nonviolently uh, in our family, with our neighbors, uh, you know, as government? Uh, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ nonviolently? Both That's very good wonderful. books. Great. Well, thank you again, Blair, for your time. Thanks for being on the show. And God bless you. And we'll talk to you soon, okay? Thanks, Aaron. Wow. This is a complicated, big topic. And as you can see, there's a ton of different viewpoints on this. I think Dr. Wilgus did a great job of uh, explaining a couple of the main viewpoints and then explaining his view of this. And I just wanna give a disclaimer that uh, we don't necessarily endorse everything that Dr. Williams or any other expert that we uh, bring on this, this show, we don't necessarily endorse all of their viewpoints. Uh, specifically, I just want you to be aware that Friends Church, when it comes to scripture, views scripture as inspired by God and every word of scripture, God breathed. And uh, this is kind of cool. Aaron didn't just reach out to Dr. Wilgus, he reached out to another Old Testament professor who has a different view and is going to represent that on, in the next episode of the Resilient Christian Podcast. So wherever you listen to your podcast, go there, subscribe to the Resilient Christian Podcast so that you'll be aware of when that next episode comes out. And I'm really stoked about this. We love the Resilient Christian Podcast so much that we've decided here at Friends Online that we're gonna produce that podcast. So make sure you're, you subscribe to our channel because coming soon you'll have, uh, you'll have the ability to get the video podcast of Resilient Christian. But in the meantime, take a look at this previous episode about defeating fear with faith. I, I believe it's gonna encourage you, encourage your, your soul, so take a look at that. Until next time, see you soon, friends. <laughs>